G'day YouTube, Quacker John here. Today I'm presenting a selection of the chats I've had with Alan. I am presenting one question from each of the five chats that I've had with Alan. And this will give an overall picture of what Alan has been saying about the Kawasaki Vulcan S. Alan is a subscriber of the channel and a regular on live stream, and now a regular on the live chat interviews. I hope you enjoy this presentation of a selection of Alan's chats. Alan is from Michigan, USA, and a subscriber of the channel, and a regular on live stream, and I am from Brisbane, Australia. G'day Alan and thanks for joining me in this interview video presentation. G'day John. G'day <laughs> all, all, you know, the whole, the whole world, whatever, how all that works. <laughs> what advice would you give people who are thinking of buying the Vulcan S for their first bike and for people who are thinking of learning to ride on the Vulcan S? Well, for learning to ride, uh, obviously, in the United States, um, you have to go get a license. And in order to get a license in most states, uh, or what they call them endorsements, but in order to do that, you have to go through an MSF class. And that will teach you some of the basics. And when you transfer that to the Vulcan, that will seem pretty easy. You'll, you'll start relying on your you'll, – you'll know about the friction zone, the throttling, and all the rest of it. That will come – to you. you, you practice that, practice, 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 that'll come pretty easy. Um, as far as advice for people, um, I think it's, you know, it's been said before, and it's what's turned some people off, oh, it's a great beginner bike. I believe that. I think if you're new to motorcycling, and you go through an MSF class, and then you get on the Vulcan, um, it'll inspire confidence, um, and, and it's a bike that you can grow into. Um, and, and maybe, you know, you know it, it'll, it'll do everything that you want it to do. Now, you have to be very honest with yourself with what you want to use the motorcycle for. Um, are you going to use it for commuting, uh, back and forth to school, uh, back and forth to a job? Um, are you going to do a lot of highway stuff, 70, 80 mile an hour stuff? Do you want to go touring? Uh, do you want to put three, four, 500 miles a day on a motorcycle? Those are some of the things you have to ask yourself. Um, if those are your long-term goals, I think the Kawasaki will get you there initially. But if you're, you know, I know people do it. I know people take the Kawasaki out and do 300 and 400 mile runs. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not in that boat. Um, I think that there may be motorcycles that would, might be a little more comfortable for that, especially if you're carrying a lot of stuff or you're, you're packing your significant other on back. Um, but again, you need to really be honest with what you want to use that bike for. But for, for a beginner, I have no problems recommending that. Um, in fact, a lot of people have said um, that if you get a small bike, a 250 or 300, within a year you're going to be looking for something more because you're just going to find that that's just not enough motorcycle. Your, your confidence levels and your skill levels will be up. Um, so you're going to get something bigger. So if you jump to a Kawasaki from there, that's great. Or if you just start on a Kawasaki, um, I think you're going to have an interview later with a gentleman who has done that. And I think you're going to find that the Kawasaki fits that, that realm. Now, there's a lot of people get turned off of that. And there's a lot of people that don't like it because it's not Harley um, or it's a Japanese bike. I mean, there's a lot of other bikes out there to choose from. My personal opinion, the Kawasaki is one of the better ones. Um, I, I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't be afraid to advise anybody for getting that Kawasaki. If you can get a good price, that was another thing for me, is getting a good price on the bike. That's the other piece of that. So, And, you know, the accessories and all the rest. All that works. All right. Thank you, Alan. Alan, you do a lot of background research before you buy anything. What bikes did you consider when buying your motorbike? Well, hello, John. Thanks for the opportunity here. Oh, that's um, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, as you know, uh, as we've discussed in the past, 
Um, I rode motorcycles back in the 70s and 80s. And it was about this time last year that I decided that uh, maybe getting back into motorcycling would be something for me to do. Um, so I looked around um, and there was two parameters that I wanted to stay within. One was budget. Um, I wanted to keep the bike about $7,000 uh, US um, and new. Uh, I really didn't want to buy a used bike that might have other people's problems uh, with it. So new and under 7000 I didn't want to finance anything. So the bikes that I initially looked at was the, Re the Honda Rebel, um, the Suzuki M50 Boulevard, obviously the Kawasaki Vulcan S, and the Yamaha Bolt. And here in Michigan, um, the dealerships um, tend to offer all of those brands within their dealerships. In other parts of, of the United States, California specifically that I'm aware of, you want to buy a, a Kawasaki, you go to a Kawasaki dealer. Um, ditto with Honda or Suzuki or Yamaha. Um, you'll, you know, same with Harley's. If you want a specific brand, that's where you go. Here in Michigan, there's an advantage where a lot of these dealers offer a lot of different products. And uh, there's a dealer here about 60 miles south of me that offers all four of those bikes on their, their showroom floor. So I had the advantage of going down and actually looking even though it was cold and wintry and all the rest of it, looking at um, the four di different motorcycles. And what I found was, for me personally, um, the styling of the Honda, although the price range for all of them are about the same, the styling of the Honda Rebel and the, the Yamaha Bolts, just, I, I don't know. There was something that, you know, um, put me off. Uh, I just didn't like it. Uh, that's my personal taste. Obviously, like anything else, when you go buy cars, you go buy shoes, you know, buy clothes, it's it's personal taste. So you have to like the styling. It has to be something that you're drawn to. And so I was kind of drawn to the Kawasaki Vulcan S and the Suzuki M50 initially. And uh, the, the M50 is a heavier bike. It's bigger. Um, and, it, you know, it just wasn't, I don't know, there was just, there's something what I, I just didn't connect with it. The Kawasaki Vulcan S, I like the styling. Kawasaki got it right. It's a light bike, 500 pounds. It's not overtly big. Um, and uh, the only, like I said earlier, that we've had conversations about, the only concerns I had with that bike was the forward uh, seating position, the pegs and the right, you know, the controls and the 650 engine. Was that going to be enough? power for a, a, a guy my size. I'm 6'1", 250 pounds, um, and I, I didn't want to have an underpowered motorcycle. Uh, those two concerns are long gone. The Suzuki, the, the, the Kawasaki, awesome. I mean, that the, the forward controls was were easy to, as you had told me, was easy to get, uh, to get a hold of and start riding and get used to. That was just all good stuff. And uh, the power is not a problem at all, um, zero. So it's what drove me to the Kawasaki. The styling, you know, the price. I've had previous experiences with Kawasaki. Um, so, you know, um, there you go. And I had the opportunity to look at all the different bikes, sit on them, and the Kawasaki just felt the best to me. So, um, and like I said, I got a good deal on mine. It was a 2019 with ABS. Um, for $5,500 and then, you know, your tax license, destination, all that stuff. But it was a good price. The dealer was just liquidating his uh, overstock from the year before. So it was just, that's where I went. Um, the, the Vulcan S has met every desire that I've had. Okay, so, so how does the booster plug work to improve the performance of the bike? Well, I would suggest if you're if you're really looking to um, do something about that initial um, throttle response and engine braking and um, off idle lean conditions, and you're thinking about the booster plug, um, go to the booster plug website. They have a very nice write up. But basically, what is going on is um, 
in since 2006, most motorcycles have what they call a closed loop system, meaning that there's an engine control unit, an ECU, that is monitoring all kinds of different sensors. In fact, I wrote some down. Uh, there's a throttle position sensor, an RPM sensor, an oil temperature sensor, an air pressure sensor, an air inlet temperature, and then the, the closed loop part of it is there's an O2 sensor at the exhaust. So the ECU is monitoring all of that, um, what's going on with, with the, the motorcycle. And obviously it's, it's, it's changing timing, it's changing you know, the fuel requirements, everything based on all of that. And when it, you know, and obviously the engineers with Kawasaki had to deal with emission controls throughout the world. Some of them are pretty lean. So they, they leaned out the, the bottom end. So right off idle going forward, um, you're, you're kind of running a lean condition. And then at some point, that lean condition goes to what would normally be a, a good air fuel ratio, say 14 to one is the perfect air fuel ratio. And then it goes. And so that's why you get this throttle response thing that's kind of ugly. The booster plug, um, and they have a nice write-up, basically fools the ECU because what it does is it plugs into your air inlet temperature sen sensor. So you, you know, it takes longer to get the thing installed uh, by because you have to lift the tank up to get your hand in, at least for the Kawasaki uh, Vulcan S. And you unplug, there's a little plug, you unplug that from the air inlet temperature sensor, and you plug the booster plug into that. Um, it's, they've got it perfectly set up, you plug, plug, and then you run their little, this little resistor piece out to some cool air. And what it's basically doing is fooling the ECU that you're running uh, the air temperature um, outside and whatnot is at 20 degrees C or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And so what that does is it kind of tells the ECU to, to fatten up the exhaust a little bit, or the exhaust, the fuel air mixture a little bit. They say about 6%. So you get a little more fuel going in, which really smooths everything out. Um, and the, the beauty about the booster plug is that I installed it um, along with the Delta Beck exhaust and I had zero codes. There was no engine codes coming whatsoever. I didn't have to take it to a, a dyno. I didn't have to have anything remapped, none of that. It was just plug and play, which is really nice. Um, and the other beauty about the booster plug is if you do have emissions uh, controls or you have a country that does those type of testing, to unplug it, is, it's, it's just the reverse. You unplug from the, the booster plug uh, the two things. You plug the uh, stock harness back into the air temperature, and you're back to stock. Um, so you could pass emissions that way or um, leave it on and go through the emissions. Um, I'm, I'm assuming since it's not throwing engine codes um, that everything is like where it's supposed to be um, from an air fuel mixture exhaust system. Because obviously it's a closed loop system. You've got that O2 at the end. It's, it's reading all of the exhaust coming out. It's telling the, the engine control unit what's happening. Uh, from an emission standpoint, the nitrous oxides, the carbon monoxides, um, all of that. And then you know, the computer's sitting there messing with your air in, you know, how much air is going in, how much fuel is going into the, the, the fuel injectors, how much timing is given, all of that. And then it, it takes into consideration a lot of other parameters with the engine, whether it's warming up, whether it's cold, whether it's hot, you know, all of those things. So that's how basically the booster plug works. Um, I have found it very good for me. Um, it, 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 it does exactly what it should. It makes, and they even say this on the booster plug um, website that, you know, um, it's, it's very effective um, in smoothing out that initial res throttle response on low RPMs. And I found that to be absolutely true. Um, the engine braking is not as severe. The, the, the throttle now is a lot more progressive. It's not Perky jerky on off. It's a lot more progressive, um, and it, it just works amazing. And there's no engine codes. You don't have to worry about any of that. You, like I said, you don't have to take it to a place, have them run it, and flash your easy. It's it's plug and play. So it, it's really, really, in my opinion, the way to go. Um, how much performance it adds, I don't know. Um, uh, all I know is it made the bike a lot more 
rideable, drivable, if you will, at low RPMs. And even you, after you put yours in, found that at low RPMs, um, grunting along at 2,500, 3,000 RPMs, maybe up a hill or just taking off, the bike's a lot smoother. It just doesn't, it, it doesn't struggle um, like it used to, you know, like it used to do. And, you know, as far as, I don't know, it, it, it just, I don't know. I, I would recommend it. Uh, it. It comes down to whether or not you want to pay that money. I, I think they're $160, $170 um, US. I don't know in other parts of the, the world what they cost, but the, the I think the original engineering was done in Denmark. Those people are excellent. Again, I, I spoke to those people um, and um, they had nothing. But, and then I did a lot of reading and, and a lot of the stuff, a lot of the testing that he did, he did a lot of it um, for a lot of different bikes. So I know he's got a lot of that stuff for the BMWs. He's got them for Harleys. He's got them for other motorcycles. Um, he's tested each and every one individually and found the right fuel ramps uh, through all of that testing. So there you go. So which Dalkovic exhaust did you have on your bike initially? You said a 16-inch uh, black. Um, I'm trying to remember, what, what was the type of exhaust? It was the what they call the 410-millimeter 16-inch slash cut. Slash cut. Uh, black, uh, black exhaust, uh, black ceramic. Um, it was very easy to install. Basically, there's two bolts to each uh header pipe up into the, the the engine and then one bolt down at the bottom very very clean install didn't leave a lot of gaps it was tight um and uh, it had a good sound um the other thing like i said i got a good price on it and the other thing i was a little concerned with because i'd originally was looking at maybe the the 21 inch um but there was a lot of reports of the 21 inch getting in the way of the swing arm and so I, I steered more to the shorter. And so that's that's what I purchased and put on initially. Um, then I came across um, a sale for the 21 inch Delcovic, and that's 550 millimeter, but it's the bull nose. It's a different design on the end of it. And so I purchased that. And that was basically a slip on. Um, Delcovic does a great job um, with engineering. So it's basically, um, you take the 16 inch exhaust, you slide it off, put the, the 21 inch on and bolt it up. And in talking to Janelle at Delkovic, she said, she told me specifically that the shorter the exhaust, the louder the sound. Um, it'll, it'll sound pipier is her word and louder. Um, that 21 inch has a nut, in my opinion, to my ears. Now everybody's ears are different, but in my my frame of hearing, has a little deeper, throatier sound. Um, and if you mount it correctly, there's some mounting instructions and a little spool piece. It clears the swing arm with no problem. There's no issues. And uh, I, I I like 21 inch muffler, you know. And they've got a lifetime warranty on it. Um, and the bike sounds good. And I had those two videos that I showed the differences. Um, and in it, I, I do believe it's a little quieter um, from a decibel range. So that's what I got now is the 21 inch. So you've got the 550 millimeter, 21 inch uh, black ceramic bullnose yes, bull yes. Delcovic yep. exhaust system on now. So what would you say is the best way of securing the Vulcan S so that you can do maintenance work on it? Well, and, and as you pointed, as you've got a video out and pointed out, um, what I found worked really well for me, um, the paddock stand, uh, operating that, you can do it by yourself. Um, you know, you, you position it underneath the spool pieces, you kind of get the bike centered, <laughs> But my but my arms were just not long enough to hang onto the handlebar, um, get the paddock stand, get where it wants to go, and then push down on it to do it. it obviously, it's a two person. It makes it a lot safer to do it with two people. A one person lift is really hard. So um, I looked around for something that would secure the front end while I lift 
lifted the rear end for maintenance on the chain and adjustment and that thing. And what I found was a wheel chock. Um, there's multiple different ways uh, and, and manufacturers of those. But as you found, um, the wheel chock, you roll the bike up onto that, it locks that front wheel in place. Um, and now the bike is very secure. Um, it's not gonna fall over or any of that. And then putting the paddock stand underneath to lift the rear wheel up for maintenance, chain adjustment, whatever, that becomes very easy for one person. Uh, very easy for one person. So, and what I also found was the, the particular wheel chock that I purchased would slide uh, on the concrete. So what I did is I anchored it to a piece of four by eight sheet of plywood um, up on the front end. And so as I rolled the motorcycle up onto the, the plywood, that holds everything in place. The front wheel just rolls up into the, the wheel chock. The bike's stable and secure. Um, and the other benefit is that it actually gets the tires off of the concrete. It, it puts it on wood. The, the wheel chock supporting that front wheel um, make, makes it all the easiest to, to, to do any kind of maintenance or put the paddock underneath it. it. It just, you know, I put it on there, even when I've done modifications, or I'm just gonna take the seat off um, or other, you know, the gas tank, whatever, I always put it up on that front wheel chock just because the bike's very, very secure. It's like a center stand, but only for the front wheel, so. Well, thank you, Alan, for your comments. I was keen to have a chat with you on video about it since you put me onto it. And I'd like to thank Alan for joining me for this chat. And I'm sure that what he said has been a real help to a lot of people. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much. You guys have a great day. <laughs> See ya. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching my video. If you enjoy my videos, subscribe to the channel. Livestream is on every Wednesday night at 10 p.m. Brisbane, Australia time. You're most welcome to join in. You are most welcome to join the Quacker John chat room. And the link for your invitation to join the Quacker John chat room is in the comments under the video. See ya!